Tonight, we're going to pick up the story in the beginning of the 60s when the rock and rollers and the hippies moved in and started their pot-filled, hazy, crazy party days. Nearly everyone who was anyone in the rock scene drifted through and spent some time in Laurel Canyon. So, okay, boomers, let's do some time tripping with Dave McGowan back to the 1960s to Laurel Canyon. It's in the Los Angeles County area. Yes, something was happening there, and it just wasn't exactly clear, that is, until now. Here's a great quote from uh, Dave's series that really sums it up very well. He wrote, Perhaps Neil Young said it best when he told an interviewer that he couldn't really say why he headed out to L.A. circa 1966. He and others... We're just going with the lemmings, man. <laughs> During our first commercial break, for your listeners who are old enough to enjoy this, you can go get your tie-dye shirt if it's still wearable. Dave, are you there? Welcome back to the program. Uh, thanks for having me back. <laughs> Before we get into the storyline, could you bring us in? Uh, could you bring us up to uh, up to progress or up to date on the progress of your book project? Do you have a publication date yet? I do not, you know, um, the strange you should ask, I actually just sent in the final piece of the puzzle, so to speak, today. Uh, I thought I was done a couple months ago, and then they decided that uh, the book that uh, could be approved upon by adding an author's preface and an introduction, so they tasked me with writing a preface and recruiting someone else um, to write the intro, you know, preferably someone with some kind of name recognition, you know, that would help them uh, from the promotion end or whatever, you know, to have another another name attached to this. So uh, I got my preface done and just sent it in actually like three or four days ago, and I just got the intro in today and uh, just literally hours ago, forwarded it on to my publisher, um, written by Nick Bryant. Do you, does that name ring a bell to you at all? No. Give me a hint. Give us a hint. Uh, he is the author of um, The Franklin Scandal, which, oh, okay. is, uh, which is often confused with The Franklin Cover-Up, which was written by former Nebraska Senator John DeCamp. And uh, it covers the same ground, basically, as the camp's book, but from a from a much less uh, from a more uh, I guess reasoned, less sensational kind of approach. Mm-hmm. Um, Nick was actually a professional journalist who had um, who had mainstream credentials at one time. He had a he had an agent, you know, a literary agent. He had a publisher, and he had a wide network of contacts in the mainstream media and he'd been he'd written for i think rolling stone i think and uh or uh, playboy maybe and uh spin some some fairly high profile um uh publications and had published a uh, an academic book and uh you know like i say it was a respected working mainstream journalist who was earning a living as such until he uh Unknowingly stepped into the Franklin, uh, you know, uh, mess, and uh, almost immediately became persona non grata. And I, I really feel bad for the guy, actually, because I don't, I don't think he really knew what he was getting into. Wow. And, uh, before he knew it, he no longer had an agent, no longer had a publisher. All of his media contacts were scattering. To, you know, didn't want nothing to do with him, and most of them don't return his calls now. And uh, Mm. He really paid a high price for uh, for what he did, you know, which is which is just a sad commentary, really, on uh, on the state of journalism in this country, really, because uh, the, the guy's very talented, and like I say, he had very very well respected mainstream credentials, and now he's uh, pretty much of a pariah, <laughs> you know. Host. And uh, so, but anyway, so he uh, he did the intro, and uh, so. Um, so the book now has an introduction and a preface and an afterward and, uh, you know, all the additional chapters. And so it's uh, it's becoming, uh, you know, a bigger and bigger, uh, you know, there's more and more and more uh, exclusive content being added to the book. So, um, you know, 
additional enticements for all of those readers who think they've already read it all based on what's on the internet. Um, mm-hmm. So you know, there will be there will be quite a bit quite a bit of uh, of new material in the book now. So I'm pretty excited about it, and uh, do not yet have a release date. I believe it's supposed to be sometime this year, sometime before the end of the year, but. I don't know exactly what the timeline is at this point, but uh, as far as I know, I'm done at my end, and, and now it's now it's uh, pretty much entirely in their hands. So, wow, we shall see. Well, well, Nick obviously touched the third rail there, and if anything, it shows you how how uh, overarching and pervasive that uh, that Franklin problem is still. That's uh, that's sad to hear. Uh, the the series uh, that you have up on your website is enormous. <laughs> you write very very long uh, installments. This is going to be a big book, isn't it? Uh, is the Laurel Canyon? Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't. I'm not sure. You know, you know, I haven't seen how they're going to format it. I don't know. You know, what kind of font or you know how how big a page is. So I, yeah, I, I'm not sure exactly how many pages it's going to run, but I would imagine quite a bit because it was a it was a pretty long series already. You know, just yeah. on what was on the internet and and I, you know, like I said, like I, I think we mentioned last time I was on that I augmented several chapters, added about six new chapters, added an afterword, and have now added also a preface and introduction and, uh, you know, an index and a bibliography. So um, I would think it would probably maybe around like 400 pages, I would I guess. would say but so. I, sure. I Is this going to be yeah. illustrated? Would, what's that? Will this be illustrated? Photos, illustrations, artwork? Uh, you know, that's another thing I don't know. I, that just came up. I just did an interview yesterday, actually. Um, I didn't know that I had two of them, uh, you know, <laughs> back to back. I, I, you know, as you know, I, I was kind of confused. I thought this one was uh, later in the week, but uh, yeah, I just uh, got asked that question yesterday, and I do. I don't know. I use a lot of photographs. And uh, you know graphics in the web series, and uh, there may be legal problems with using some of them, I would think. But a sure. lot of them are actually my own original photographs that I went over and, and took of my set, took myself of uh, uh-huh. you know significant sort of iconic uh, structures and, and lots where where iconic structures once stood and whatnot. And uh, I don't see why they wouldn't be able to use all those. Um, so um, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that that, that they will. Uh, you know, um, and, and, you know, I, and I don't know if they do. If they'll like be spread out throughout the book, or they'll you know like all be grouped in a central section, or mm-hmm. you know, all all of those kind of decisions are are, are in their hands. So until I actually see some, uh, you know. See something? I, I I'm not really sure, but uh, I'm just keeping my fingers crossed and hoping that I'm gonna love what they uh, how they how they put it together and package it. You know. I'm curious, Dave. Has word gotten out about your book and the series such that have any of the the rockers that you write about gotten in touch with you and you know for input or anything like that? And gosh, we got some music playing, so we're gonna take a little bit of a break there. Okay, Dave, the last time you were with us, we went all the way through up into the 50s. And uh, when did, let's pick this up in the 60s. Uh, now, you know, everybody grows up and you settle down. And, you know, all the young lions of the 50s, you know, they, they settled down. They got married. They went about their business. And who moved into Laurel Canyon in the 60s that took this party to the next level? Oh, the better question might be who didn't move into Laurel Canyon, <laughs> you know, as far, which is uh, – which is astonishing to a lot of people, you know, because, I mean, to this day, most people associate uh, the hate up in San Francisco as sort of the center of the musical universe, you know, of the 1960s, and that really wasn't true. It was, uh, it was Laurel Canyon, and uh, I, I, I don't even know where to begin. The Turtles, The Doors, Buffalo Springfield, The Birds, Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention, Love, uh, The Doors, uh, Three Dog Night. The Beach Boys, uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, The Eagles, Jackson Brown, um, James Taylor, Carol King, uh, 
Joni Mitchell, uh, Judy Collins, uh, Warren Zevon, um, uh, May, uh, Rick, what was it, Rick Mayow, I think, um, mm-hmm. Paul Williams, the songwriter, uh, the Mamas and the Papas, uh, and I'm sure uh, Alice Cooper, um, and I'm sure a whole bunch that I'm leaving out. Uh, it's just just an, an amazing array of uh, artists, singers, songwriters, musicians um, that took up residence in that canyon beginning around like 1964 through like the late 70s. And um, yeah, it's just just mind boggling the the number of uh, of artists and the variety of, of artists that, that uh, came out of that one little tiny little uh, isolated neighborhood up in the hills of L.A. Well, it's a great looking area, that's for sure. I mean, it's, it's got natural aesthetic beauty. I mean, it's just a gorgeous place to, to uh, you know, go through and to visit. And you can certainly understand if you just look at the pictures, uh, you can understand the attraction. Nice real estate. Yeah, it's a very bucolic, very rustic, very heavily wooded. Uh, It does not feel like L.A. at all. Um, You know, it it feels like worlds apart from, uh, from, you know, the concrete and asphalt of Los Angeles. Um, And, you know, you get up in there, it's very easy to forget that you are in 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 pretty much in the heart of the city. So, uh, yeah, it's got a lot of privacy, and, you know, it had a lot of appeal to that whole sort of bohemian, you know, uh, attitude that was, you know, prevalent in the 1960s. And, uh, yeah, it just became the place for rock stars and their groupies, and, and and it was a much more open scene back in those days. I mean, you read accounts all the time of just, you know, groupies literally just walking up to rock stars' doors and knocking on the front door and being invited into party and stuff. I mean, things that you would never, you know, now, nowadays these people are, you know, living in multi-million dollar guarded estates behind, you know, three security fences and whatnot. And an army uh, of security much, people. What's and that? They all, they all have, you know, these, these small platoons or large platoons of security yeah, people that you don't want to encounter. Yeah. Yeah, but it wasn't like that. I mean, back then it was, uh, you know, you had uh, the groupies and the rock stars and the serial killers, you know, all, all yeah, happily well, mingling. Well, you mentioned serial and killers. Uh, yeah, but, uh, what's his name? Charlie Manson was one of the um, uh, folks that drifted through there, right? He was one of the most prominent, uh, yeah, prominent figures in the canyon. And, you know, I mean, to this day, you know, um, I would guess probably around the world just as famous as, uh, you know, the David Crosbys and the Frank Zappas and the John Phillips and, you know, whatnot. He's probably got as much name recognition as uh, as most of them. And, um, you know, had things gone a little bit, Differently, uh, he he might be up there on that same pedestal with them. Instead of being the most reviled man in America, you know, he he could have uh, just as easily have, have uh, you know been one of them. So uh, yeah, it's very interesting, very interesting mix of people, and uh, yeah, much 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 different feel. Um, yeah, the rock rock stars were were much more much more accessible and. Uh, and whatnot in in those days, and it was very common for uh, you know there were a number of houses up there. John Phillips was one of them. Uh, Monkey uh, Mike Nesmith, that's another one. The Monkeys mm-hmm. uh, was another one, and uh, you know Mama Cass's home uh, and Frank Zappa's home just became these sort of informal gathering spots where on any given day. You know, you could drop in and, you know, you might see, like, Eric Clapton and David Crosby and, and, you know, the three or four other people from other bands all jamming together and writing songs together. And, uh, you know, it was just a very uh, communal, musically oriented environment. And, uh, you know, from from what I hear, you you could just walk through the canyon and just hear live music. You know, you could you could, you know you walk down one street and, and Buffalo Springfield is out in their backyard rehearsing, and you walk down another street and and <laughs> the Doors are, are in their garage rehearsing. And uh, wow, you know, just just an amazing uh, 
an amazing scene, but uh, with very dark, dark undercurrents that uh, that have never really been very widely reported, and that's kind of where my book comes in to sort of shatter some <laughs> some of these uh, some of these uh, myths, you know. But um, but I mean, it was a very, very different scene and a very, very different world back then than, than what we live in today. And uh, Dave, yeah, we're about I mean, to slide into a commercial break, but on the other side, let's get into some of the the dark, shadowy things. Okay, Dave, uh, we were talking about uh, the Laurel Canyon area, and we've established that it's that the real estate's fantastic. It's a beautiful area. It's in Los Angeles, so the climate is terrific most of the time. Um, and you've got all these creative artist types, a lot of beautiful people. What could possibly be dark about the Laurel Canyon scene, Dave? Um, Besides well, Charlie. Uh, besides Charlie. Charlie's yeah. really just a the iceberg. Um, there was just so much violent death associated with that scene. So many people who were murdered in Laurel Canyon or so many people connected to Laurel Canyon who were killed under very suspicious circumstances. Um, sometimes, like, entire families just wiped out, you know, one after the other, all under, you know, like Graham Parsons, his entire family really kind of perished under under very suspicious circumstances. Same with uh, uh, Judy Sill, who's uh, long forgotten now, but was, uh, back at the time, was, was regarded as an equal to, like, you know, Carol King and, and Joni Mitchell and, and whatnot, and was, uh, you know, considered one of the brightest rising stars in the canyon, and, uh, now completely forgotten as, as if she never existed and yeah. uh, and her, her her entire family really just died at young ages under under very very uh strange circumstances and and so too did um uh, this other family I can't think of the name of who was a girlfriend of a lot of the girlfriends and wives um seemed to perish uh, under under suspicious circumstances, you know, one of David Crosby's girlfriends, one of Graham Nash's, Jackson Brown's wife, um, just it's just a withering. Of, I mean, for a, a scene that was supposed to be all about peace, love, and understanding, um, there was just this incredible backdrop of violence and uh, of people packing guns. You know, packing heat. David Crosby. Uh, was a gun aficionado, regularly carried a gun, John Phillips as well. And, you know, yeah, why do these people, you know, why do these people feel the need to pack heat, you know? So, yeah, it was just uh, a lot of violence. And, uh, you know, of course, Charlie, well, there was two, actually. Charlie, the, the Manson murders were the most uh, high-profile, the most high-profile bloodbath associated with Laurel Canyon and, uh, and all everyone involved in that, the uh, victims as well as the perpetrators, were all very closely connected to uh, to Laurel Canyon. Um, you know, Jay Sebring was uh, the stylist who created uh, you know Jim Morrison's signature uh, hairstyle and yeah. uh, and various other arts as well. And and John Phillips was one of the principal investors in his Sebring International. Uh, corporation. So, you know, he was very closely tied. Sharon Tate as well, very, very closely tied uh, to a lot of the people in Laurel Canyon. And the uh, uh, Folger and Frykowski actually were living in a rental house in Laurel Canyon, just right across the road from Mama Cass's house. Um, and then, of course, Charlie and, and his people were regulars in Laurel Canyon. So everybody involved in that were... were uh, you know, and that's one of the things that people don't really understand about the Manson murders is that, uh, you know, the victims and the the uh, the victims and the and the perpetrators were were very very closely associated and had a lot of mutual friends and hung out at the same places and uh, you know they they weren't that far removed from one another and um, the other big bloodbath. Um, that occurred right in Laurel Canyon were the Wonderland murders, also known as the Four on the Floor murders, where uh, four known drug dealers were bludgeoned to death with uh, lead pipes in uh, you know what is what is regarded as one of the to this day as one of the bloodiest mass murders in uh, in this very bloody city's history. 
and uh, and that again was uh, was associated uh, with the you know what that occurred in Laurel Canyon, and uh, and these guys were actually suppliers for some of the uh, you know the, the Laurel Canyon royalty. Um, one of the lead singers from Three Dog Night, Chuck Negron, Negron, Negron. I'm not sure how you how his name is pronounced, but. Uh, he had said in interviews that he was actually supposed to be go. He was going to go over there and make a buy that very night, mm-hmm. but uh, he was passed out and didn't make it over. And uh, you know, he said that 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 he might have very well have been uh, a fifth victim. You know, mm-hmm. had he made it over. So uh, yeah, there was just an incredible amount of violence and uh, a lot of it uh, fueled by the drug trade. Because there are strong indications that the Manson family and uh, and Folger and Frykowski and Sebring as well were were all uh, were all pretty heavily involved in drug in drug trafficking. So um, a lot, yeah, a lot of drug trafficking and a lot of violence, um, you know, just lurking just be, just beneath the surface of that. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, very bucolic, peace loving <laughs> kind of scene. So. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a major, uh, there's, you know, there's, there's, it's just a glaring, you know, it just, it just doesn't quite fit with the image that, uh, you know, that we have of the scene. That's, uh, and so that that's one of the dark currents. And um, also a lot of appearance of a lot of, of governmental covert type, uh, activity going on in and around the canyon as well. Um, Such as what, Dave? Sort of another, excuse me? Such as, I mean, what kind of covert activities? Uh, well, we, there was actually a military, a covert military facility located right in the canyon that was operational up until like 1969, or officially anyway, you know, possibly beyond that. And uh, right in the center, you know, I mean, right, literally, right smack dab in the heart of hippiedom was this covert, secret, uh, you know, military intelligence facility um, that, you know, numerous people trooped into and reported to work every day, you know, driving right through the canyons alongside, you know, all the hippies and flower children. And, uh, you know, that that's that's a little odd as well. Was, and, that, the, uh, was that the old movie studio? It was yeah. I mean, the primary purpose of it was producing, uh, was processing film, uh, film stock of atomic weapons tests, and uh, producing propaganda films. Uh, basically, that was the that was the stated purpose of it. You know, um, and it was said to be the most fully equipped autonomous studio in. Uh, more so than any of the ones down the hill in Hollywood, you know, it was the, the the world's most complete film studio, complete with climate control vaults and animation departments, special effects. You know, I mean, uh, from what I've heard, a lot of the technology that you know uh, ultimately filtered into mainstream films was actually pioneered at uh, Lookout Mountain Laboratory. And, That's uh, just it was, really it something. Was, is is any of that studio yeah. still there? Excuse me? Is any of that studio still there? The structure is, but it's been converted to um, like some kind of residential housing now, I believe. Uh, how about that? Um, little, little do they know what was once going on there. Dave, we're going to take a little bit of a break as we roll into our last segment. Dave McGowan's with us, and we'll be right back in just a few minutes. Okay, Dave, are you still there? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, Dave, uh, let's see, where was I here? One of the things that absolutely intrigued me about the uh, Laurel Canyon story is the military connection of so many of these rockers. Tell us about that. Yeah, it's it's just uh, yeah, it's another thing that's just uh, it's just it's just there's so many that it's very hard to believe that it is not uh, significance to it. Uh, you know, Jim Jim Morrison. Being perhaps the most uh, notorious example, whose father was actually the Navy admiral who was uh, in charge of the uh, Pacific Fleet that got involved in the Gulf of Tonkin incident. Mm-hmm. So uh, his dad was uh, a central character in the incident that uh, vastly ex- escalated the uh, 
the Vietnam War. So yet, yet him, the admiral's son, and uh, Frank Zappa. Father was a chemical warfare engineer uh, assigned initially to uh, the Edgewood Arsenal in uh, outside of Baltimore, and uh, Frank Zappa was actually born and raised on the base and attended uh, attended school on the uh, within the you know lived in and attended school on uh, in within the uh, you know confines of Edgewood Arsenal for like the first seven years of his life. And then, you know, John Phillips, he was the son of a career uh, Marine Corps officer uh, who had deep uh, political connections. Uh, you know, John uh, Phillips' first wife was actually a direct descendant of, uh, of President John Adams. And, um, Amazing. And she was also an employee of the Pentagon, and as was, uh, in fact, John, uh, John Phillips' His first wife, his mother, his sister, and his father were all employed in various capacities by the U.S. Defense Department, by the Pentagon. You know, I mean, virtually his entire family. And, uh, you know, and the list just goes on and on and on. Stephen Stills' uh, father was, in, was some kind of involved in some kind of covert operations down in Central America, uh, spent a lot of time bopping around various hot spots in Central America, and, uh, you know, Stephen attended military schools uh, down there off and on. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's just, it, the list just, it, it's just, a, it's a mind-boggling list. As you go through it, it's very, very hard to find someone who had a very high profile in the canyon who wasn't, you know, from that, uh, from the military, you know, intelligence community, you know, or from a military intelligence family, rather. And, uh, and some of them even, even knew each other and had past connections, like uh, Frank Zappa, not only was he the son of a chemical warfare engineer, but his wife, his longtime wife, was the daughter of a career... Um, a career naval officer who did uh, atomic weapons research, I believe it was, and uh, you know her her whole family was uh, was military oriented, and uh, she had actually attended the same naval kindergarten as uh, Admiral Son um, Jim Morrison, you know, and then you know like you know, twenty years later they come together again in Laurel Canyon, you know, these two people who had known each other way back in kindergarten as both as military brats and then they they come together as these you know these uh, musical icons in Laurel Canyon many years later you know and you got to ask yourself is that really all just a coincidence you know i mean the, all of these people come from military families and they're all clustered around this this covert military installation and you know i mean it's just at some point you know, it just becomes a little, little hard to believe that it's all just, you know, that there's not some significance to all that, you know. And of course, how it all came together is the is the big mystery. And you know, I suppose a cynical person could look at the situation and say, well, you know, they were just funded and they were they were provided with musicians and this, that, and the other thing. But you know, and you could sort of wrap your mind around an argument like that. But if you look back at the music, I mean, just. Go back, folks, and listen to those Doors albums. They're fantastic. Not every cut's great, but the vast majority of, of a lot of the music from that time, if you go back and you listen to it again, especially if you haven't heard it in a long, long time, it's very, very good stuff, and it stands the test of time. It really does. So how it all came together with these unique people is, is just a modern-day mystery as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, there's no doubt that there was a phenomenal amount of talent and and uh, and and just amazingly prolific. I mean, compared to now, the speed with which these bands formed and came together and began, you know, recording their own original music and how quickly they put it out. And you know, I don't think I mean it was not unusual at all for bands to put out two albums a year. You know, you were expected to pump out a new album like every six months. You know, the birds were the birds were putting out albums like every. The Beach Boys were putting out like three albums a year in a, in a three and a half year span. They put out ten albums. You know, which would take a band now what like maybe thirty, forty years to build mm -hmm. up that kind of a catalog of material. You know, I mean, 
you know, it can take four or five years now for a band to produce enough material and polish it enough that they're ready to go into the studio and, and cut an album. And, uh, I mean, back then they were writing songs and they'd be in the studio the next week. And, uh, and they didn't waste a lot of time in the studio either. I mean, they, they'd go in and cut an album in like a, you know, a couple of days, you know, one or two takes on each song and, and, Bam. you know, it was, they, yeah, it was just, I mean, an amazing amount of music and just a you know, phenomenal amount of talent. And, uh, yeah, I mean, they're just, just way, well beyond what, you know, I mean, yeah, we're used to waiting forever for. I mean, you 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 had to keep you know you had to keep your music in the in the public ear at all times. You know, I mean, they, mm-hmm. if they if they, a group that they, back then that would sit around for two or three years working on an album would be a group that no longer had a career. You know, you're right because the music was progressing and changing at at just lightning speed. It was uh, it was really quite a time. Uh, we're, we've got about a minute or so left, Dave. Is there is there any pop music activity going on currently in the Laurel Canyon area, or is the whole LC scene done? Uh, to some extent, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, they're not not like today's artists, but but more recently, um, uh, Slash from Guns N' Roses uh, is a product of Laurel Canyon. He was actually born, I believe, in the late '60s, and uh, his early his parents were were in uh, you know in the industry and uh, as a little tiny kid he kind of grew up around us and knew some of these people and then you know like twenty years later he emerged as a star in his own right from Laurel Canyon and uh, Anthony Kiedis of the Red Hot Chili Peppers was also a uh, product of Laurel Canyon uh, and you know uh, grew up in, in that whole environment and then you know emerged as, as a big star himself so. Uh, and Rick Rubin, who is one of the most esteemed and prolific record producers yeah. out there, uh, until fairly le- recently was was living in Laurel Canyon and, and working out of his home, and he produced albums for like Guns and Roses and and uh, I love what he did with I love what he did with Johnny Cash. That was so fantastic. Johnny, yeah, he did Johnny Cash's American, whatever, yeah. Those were all produced, in, a lot of those were produced right in his home in Laurel Canyon, right next Amazing. door to where the log cabin used to be. How about that? So, yeah. They were, you know, they were just about cool. out of time. You've got so many interesting stuff, uh, things on your website. You have your special report on the Boston Marathon issue. You've got Wagon the Moon Doggy in addition to your inside LC, and uh, you guys a lot of stuff here on 9-11. Are you working on any new series that you can tell us about? Not to know. The Boss is the most recent one, and, you know, I'm still uh, I'm still providing my publisher with what he wants from me, but although I think I'm finally done with that. I think mm-hmm. the only thing I have left to do on that is give a final review and approval on the, on the galleys once they... Have have it all formatted and put together, and uh, so uh, that, that's kind of my main focus right now. Is well, that's that's plenty. That that's more than plenty. Listen, Dave, when your when your book uh, is getting ready to to come out, please let your publisher know that we'd love to have you back on the program again. Already, will do definitely. Very good, Dave. Absolutely. Thanks so much for your time. I appreciate it. And for our listeners, you can keep up with all of Dave's work at daveswebcnchost.com. That's our program for this evening. Thanks for being with us. Tomorrow night, we'll be back with more Far Out Mate Radio. And uh, for the rest of your evening, have a good time, and we'll be back tomorrow. Take care. Be well.